Good morning. Good to be here with you. All right. Good to go. So I'll continue to go through the book of James this morning. Um, I've uh, really been encouraged myself personally studying the book of James. It's uh, been a, a really good thing for me, and I hope it's been for you as well. Uh, I'm hoping to wrap up next week um, and do the, the last message on the book of James. If you uh, have your Bibles with me, I'd like you to turn with me to James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. James chapter 5, starting at verse 7. All right, let's read together. If you don't have Bibles, you can follow along up here. If you can read that, it's probably a little bit small. James 5, 7 says, To be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, he says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So let's stop there, and let's go back to verse 7. Verse 7 says this, says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. You know, so often... I think we've heard this statement, right? We've grown, especially believers, we've grown up with this thought, oh, Jesus is coming soon. And James is saying this, remember he's speaking to a church who has uh, been starting to experience some pretty heavy persecution. They've been scattered. And so he's encouraging them to remember that Jesus is coming soon. And so he says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. You know, an interesting thing is uh, the, the word patience. Patience is something I think every single, body, every single person, every single body in this room, at one time or another, you know, I've struggled with patience or with patience. I've struggled with, with uh, the, the long checkout lines. You know, I've, I've struggled with being in a traffic jam and, and getting upset because I had a target, I had a schedule time, and I know I'm not going to get there. I'm off schedule. We, we've struggled with some of these things. Um, you know, and, and these are just our daily, day-to-day -day things when it comes to, to being patient. But, you know, we've also, some of us have been impatient for the coming of the Lord. Some of us long to see Him come in the clouds and His glory and set all the wrong things right in this world. I mean, who's with me on that? We want to see that, right? We want to see God be just. We, we, we want to see him uh, right all the wrongs and, and change all the bad things that have happened, all the corrupt governments, all the, all the thieving and all the lying and all the stealing, you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, we long for justice to prevail. And yet at the same time, as we think about this whole uh, understanding there, we we know that he's speaking about something more. You know, the coming of the Lord, but also in our day-to-day -day lives to understand that we need patience. He says, he says, see how the farmer waits. How the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. And you know, if you look at a farmer, you're so grateful in, in that, that he understands the law of the harvest. You, you underst he understands that the seeds that he has put in the ground, 
um, he won't be able to harvest right away. And he waits upon God to bring the, the right amount of rain for his crops so he can harvest them. So the farmer, in some ways, um, ex- expresses this attitude of patience. And, and he's saying here, look at the farmer in your life as you wait upon the Lord. He says, you also be patient. And then he says this, he says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. This is kind of what I want to focus on, this thought about establishing our, our hearts. Do you know that we can wait well or we can wait poorly? As we wait upon the Lord, as we wait upon things in life, we can wait well or we can wait poorly. And I, I realize today that, that some of you maybe don't struggle with waiting in, in traffic jams or waiting at a stoplight or, or waiting in checkout lines. You know, maybe that's not a big deal to you, but some of you are dealing with maybe much greater things, like maybe some of you are waiting for God to bring a spouse along. Maybe you're single. Maybe you long for that day where God brings a special someone into your life. Maybe some of you are, are barren and are, are patiently asking God, Lord, would you send us a baby? Would you send us a, a child that we could hold and call our own and, and be that's our own flesh and blood? So, so, you know, some of us are waiting for different things. Some of us are waiting for our children to accept Christ. Some of us are waiting for our brothers and sisters, our loved ones, to, to give their lives over to the Lord. And, and we're, we're sometimes stuck in this area of limbo. Lord, when are you finally going to do what I've been asking you to do for years? Maybe some of you have asked the Lord specifically for something in your life for year after year after year, and you're like, Lord, when? How long do I need to wait for you to come through? And, and so James is saying, as you're, even as you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, which is a huge thing, but he says, establish your hearts, your hearts while you're waiting. And this is just this thought, as I wait for the Lord, am I going to use the time that he's the, or am I just going to be impatiently trying to get through this till I finally get what I need? So we can either wait well or we can wait poorly in our life. Carol, Carol McLeod has written quite a bit of, along this. I, I've enjoyed some of her writing. I just want to read what she says in regards to this. She says, It seems like I have spent my entire life simply waiting for something. And some of you can probably identify with that. Or for God to move on my behalf. She says, how many ordinary days have dragged along when I had my heart and mind set on tomorrow? Ever feel like that? How many mundane, how many ordinary days, how many boring days just kind of drag along because you're not living in the here and now. You're always anticipating what I'm asking for is going to come tomorrow. And you're not making the most use of your time today. And so she says this, the truth of the matter is this. We all have to wait for something. And it is my personal choice whether I will wait well or wait poorly. And she says, refuse to worry while you wait. Worrying is a waste of time, energy, and emotions. Worry is infamous for destroying a vast number of todays. The definition of prayer is not worrying on my knees. So we don't need to do this. As we're anticipating and and waiting upon God to provide us with something, to give us this uh, this thing that we've been longing for for maybe years. Maybe it's not even been years. Maybe it's just been a short time. But as we've been waiting upon God, we don't need to worry. There's there's things that we can occupy our time with. You know, I'm kind of reminded of the, the parable of talents where where Jesus is giving this illustration to his followers, and he's saying like a master who, who gives five talents to one, two talents to another, and one talent to another. And then he goes away on a journey, but with this promise that he's going to come back again. And, and I feel like many of us are, are in a very similar situation in our own lives. Um, you know, we've given our life over to the Lord, and, and, and yet... Um, so often, all we can think about is tomorrow. And, you know, I, I want to be careful how I say that. I don't mean that we shouldn't be 
prepare for tomorrow. But we need to remember that God has given us today. He's given us today. So instead of being impatient about what we're looking towards, let's remember that today is a gift that God has given us. Let's do our best to wait well, to be productive while we're waiting. In the story of the talents, you know, the, the, the man that had the five talents doubled his, his Lord's investment. So he waited well. He was productive and fruitful while he waited. Same with the one who had two. But the one who had one went and buried his talent in the sand. And, and, and the picture, the word picture I get from that is somebody who did not wait well, but impatiently uh, anticipated the return of the Lord, or maybe didn't even anticipate it, um, but did not use in the, the investment, the time that God had given to him uh, for the sake of his master. Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says, By Noah, being warned by God concerning events as unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You know, if you look at Noah's life, you understand something pretty significant. Here was, here was a man that God had instructed to prepare an ark for the saving of a household. So, you know, you know, God had given him instructions on how to build this. And as we look at history, where it, 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 it demonstrates to us that it probably took him about 120 years to build this ark. You know, that's an incredible um, degree of patience, in a sense, given by this man. And that's why Hebrews chapter 11 talks about um, specialty. He's just, he's kind of reminding um, the, the, the world around him, the observers of faith, that here was a man that spent 120 years preparing for God to do a work. So he patiently waited year after year after year. But while he waited, he built and prepared, and built and prepared. You know, and it's an incredible uh, story that we read in, in Genesis chapter 6, that as he c comes into this ark at just the right time, God closes the door behind him, and him and his family are saved from disaster that comes upon the world. And, and so it's, it's this kind of literally putting this thought into place that James says, you know, waiting for the, the early and the late rains, right? Um, for at just the appropriate time, the rains came. But he was inside uh, this vessel that God had instructed him to prepare. So you see the, the, the uh, patience there of Noah. And then in verse 8 there too, um, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with them of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So God did an amazing work in Abraham's life. He called him out of this land that he had grown up in and he sent him to his promised land. But all along the way, Abraham expresses patience. You know, he never settled in one area and said, well, this is where I'm going to build my kingdom because he recognized that he was uh, working for a kingdom whose builder and maker was God, whose foundation was laid up in heaven. So his, his, he was never content with the things of this world. He had a faith in God, incredible faith. You know, as, as we look at Abraham's life, we know that 
that that wasn't always the case. We know that there were times of wavering in his life. We know that, you know, he came to this conclusion at one point in his life where he said, God, I, I recognize that you've promised that I'm going to have an heir, but it must be my servant Eliezer of Damascus. So he, he starts coming to this conclusion that when God promised him descendants as many as the sand of the seashore, that it must have been through his servant. And then God expressly tells him, no, you will bear a child, it will be of your own flesh and blood. And so anyways, him and Sarah, then we understand as we study scripture that him and Sarah did not necessarily wait for the Lord's timing, did they? They, they decided that maybe since Sarah was barren that they would go through, they, you know, they would, they would help God out a little bit and they would, they would um, provide Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, to Abraham as a wife so that, that she could bear a child for Abraham. And then that would be how God would fulfill his promise. And God never intended that to happen. And God had a perfect plan. But, you know, be, before you disregard Abraham and Sarah and say, well, how were they demonstrating this patience, this waiting upon the Lord um, in this particular passage here, you understand in Hebrews chapter 11 that, that God thought very highly of Abraham and Sarah, even with their failure, even the, with the fact that they did some things themselves. God thought very highly of them and included them in Hebrews chapter 11 as, as an example of faith because at some point both of them believed enough to be willing to be a part of procreation and to, to be a part of this plan to bring Isaac into the world. And it took faith to do that. At an old age, it took faith for them to both say, you know what, uh, we're taking God by faith and God has said that he's going to produce a son through Sarah. And, and if, as you look at their lives, you know that something happened along the line. So, you know, somewhere along the way, both of them recognized that it wasn't their own way. It wasn't their own way of doing things that was going to produce this error. But God had made a promise and God was going to be faithful to his word. And so, you know, we, we see that God is so merciful. God is so loving to us despite our failures. And despite the fact that we often try to do things our own way. God often still intervenes. God understands that scripture says that we are but dust. He understands that we're going to mess up and we're going to fail. But he appreciated the fact that they overcame their failures. And they still believed in God and God produced the air through them. In Psalm chapter 27, we read this, I believe, in verse 13, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, he says. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In verse 9, we, we, we read this, this thought as we're, as we're waiting upon the Lord, as we're patiently anticipating the coming of the Lord and, and all the things that we're doing, how we're living life now. Uh, James says this, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged because behold, the judge is standing at the door. And how many of us know that, that when we're impatient and we're waiting for God, that so often we tend to grumble. We tend to complain. We tend to, to voice to other people that things are not working out the way they should. Our countenance does not reflect the image of Christ. And so James is saying this here, as you're, as you're thinking about your patience or your lack of patience, as you're thinking about what you've been waiting upon the Lord for, don't grumble while you wait. Don't grumble while you wait. Because as you grumble while you wait, you're not waiting well. Remember, you can wait well or you can wait poorly. So he says, as you wait upon the Lord, don't grumble so that you may not be judged. And so why does he say that? Because there's people around you that are going to make judgments about you. 
They're going to look at, at the way you handle situations. They're going to look at, at, you know, she calls herself a Christian, and she's going through this tough situation, and all she is is negative. All she does is complain. There's this bitterness coming. I thought you said you were different. I thought you said that no matter what happened, you had a friend that sticks closer to you than a brother. You know, and, and so people come to conclusions about us, and that's what he's saying here, don't grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. Then he says, behold, there is a judge, there is the, the real judge, the, the judge of the universe, he's standing at the door. He's ready to come. You know, you're anticipating, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, you're waiting for God to come through for you, and he says this, behold, the judge is standing at the door. Really, he's, he's there all along, He's waiting for you. So live your life in such a way that you can anticipate his return. That you, can, that you know that when, when the judge comes back, that his words to you will be, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So, so live in such a way that, that the, the judge is on your side. He says the judge is standing at the door. So don't be negative while you wait. Somebody has said this, we need to throw away negativity like yesterday's garbage. Throw away negativity like yesterday's garbage. Why do we, why do we hold on to these things? You know, so often we become bitter. We allow this, this, um, this lack of getting what we've asked for to come into our heart and, and we start to become negative. We become these pessimistic people who find something wrong with everybody and everything. And then, and then sarcasm and, and, and these kinds of things come out of our life. You know, most of us probably don't have to think very far. Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe uh, we look at ourselves and we see, you know, there's bitterness coming forth out of my life. There's a stench coming out of my life. And it's not favorable. It does not present Christ well. So often we, we have this thought that nothing will ever change. This is always just going to be the same way. Nobody loves me. Nobody, nobody invites me over. Nobody, nobody ever wants to be with me. And you know what, brothers and sisters, when we start developing that kind of mindset, it's probably true that people don't want to have you over. It's probably true that you might not get invited to places. And, and you know what? Should, should that be the case? Maybe not. Maybe as, as Christians we should rise above those things and still invite people over and minister to them. But I know from experience, and some of you know from experience, that <clears throat> sometimes at the end of a day where you have spent time with a person that is negative and critical and always complaining, and always spewing their, their verbal vomit all over you, so to speak. You, you, you come to the end of your day, and you're drained. And you might look at your spouse and say, wow, I hope we don't get together with them too often. And that's kind of sad to, to say that, but that's true. That's, that's, that's true if we have this kind of grumbling Negative spirit. You know, we're, we're, not a, we're not this sweet-smelling aroma to people. In fact, it's kind of a stench when we're with them, if this is what comes out of our life. This is what happens when, when a life of bitterness grabs a hold of us. You know, it doesn't take very much to see that, and we probably know people all around us who, who spend their, their life away from people staying at home because they feel like everybody's rejected them. Well, maybe there's something more to it than you know. Maybe, maybe they feel like everybody's rejected them, but maybe it's this thought that every time they're with somebody, all they are is negative about themselves. And, and this bitterness sometimes prevents people from, from ministering maybe the way they should. No one is interested in our impatient germs. You ever thought about that?
No one really wants to hear the complaining and the negativity. I mean, the people that are often the most popular are the ones that you spend a day with and you get energy from them. You get encouragement from them. You get uh, this, this inner joy that says, you know what, we need to do this more often. We need to, you, you know, you need to invite us over more often or we need to go to your place more often. And, and I think if we, every single one of us was honest, we would want that to be said about us. We want to be that kind of person. So this just goes back to this thought, as we're waiting upon the Lord, we can wait well or we can wait poorly. So as we wait, let's wait with a good spirit. You know, think about how God is blessing you rather than the things that you're missing in life. Think about some of the good things that God has given you. Think about how he cares about you. Think about how he's protected you. Think about how he's provided for you. You know, all of these things, um, many of us, I think probably every one of us can speak to and say, you know what, God is faithful. He's never let me down. He's never failed me. So if we, we focus on some of those things, it takes away from a, a grumbling spirit. Verse 10 there says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets in the name of the Lord. He says in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So, one of the things we need to, to kind of keep in mind here is that the, the Jerusalem church had been going through um, a, a really difficult time of persecution. And so James is, is reminding his followers to be patient, to endure. And in order to be patient and endure, he's saying, look at the examples of some of the prophets. Look at the example of Job so that you don't become weary in while doing, so that you don't want to give up in your faith because, you know what, brothers and sisters, we, we haven't really experienced that kind of persecution that, that many have and that are even now going on, in, especially in many third world countries around the, the world today, many are experiencing a, a, a vast degree of persecution that, that we can, can't really identify with because we haven't experienced it personally. We can observe it from a distance and we can sympathize but very often we can't completely identify with it because we haven't experienced the loss of loved ones. We haven't experienced the physical suffering that comes with persecution. But, but here in the book of James, remember, the book of James was written around AD 44, somewhere between AD 44 and 46. And some really difficult things had already happened. Um, Stephen had already been martyred. Um, Saul who later became Paul, was persecuting the church. And, and people were fleeing from this, this heavy persecution that was going on around the land. James the Apostle, not James who wrote the, this book, but James the Apostle had been put to death. We know Peter miraculously escaped from prison, from, from Herod, who was also going to put Peter to death. And, and as a result of the church praying, God delivered Peter and, and Peter didn't end up dying. But there was all kinds of these things that were going on in the early church. And as James was writing these things, he was encouraging his followers to, to consider some of the people in the past who had also experienced suffering. And especially, he's talking about Job. And we know about Job's suffering and, and the steadfastness he's, he's um, sh uh, sharing there that Job did. But even, he's saying about the prophets. You know, I don't know how many of you know this, but, but if you look at some of the major prophets, like especially, I'm thinking of Jeremiah. Jeremiah went through um, a, a lot of persecution, heavy persecution. Um, you know, he was lowered into this miry pit, and he was, he was left there in this pit, you know, because of his preaching the word of God to, to the people there. But you know, there's a verse that, that I came across in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 27, that Jeremiah says, and, and it just kind of reminds me a little bit of this area of patience and, and how, how must he have done this. But in Jeremiah 7, 27, God says this to Jeremiah. He says, So you shall speak all these words to them, 
but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. And it's interesting because God specifically called Jeremiah as a child. He called him in to, to be this prophet to the nation of Israel. But he, he, he says to Jeremiah, you're going to preach to a people who won't listen to you. You're going to call out to them and they won't even answer you. You know, I, I can't imagine that. You know, I'm so grateful that, that I, have, I have the opportunity to preach to a group of people. And many of you, you do listen. You're very responsive. And I praise the Lord for that. But can you imagine having this mandate that God had called you to preach to a bunch of people, but they would never listen to you? You know, that takes patience. And that takes a spirit of, of steadfastness. And, you know, throughout the Old Testament, many of these prophets suffered severely for the sake of God because of the message that God had, had commanded them to preach. You know, Job himself, um, what, a, what a testimony in his life, right? He goes from, from being this wealthy man and losing, in one day, losing almost everything he owned. And then his whole family, all his children, die. And then not only that, but he ends up experiencing massive pain and, and sickness, disease in his own body. So he's, he's emotionally spent. He's spiritually spent. And he's physically in, in deep pain. And over and over and over again, as you look at Job's life, you can point out one thing after another thing. You can see the, the difficulty that this man experienced. And yet, James says here, this man was steadfast. He was steadfast. He, he didn't allow these things to trip him up. And you, you know, you would say he waited well. He didn't wait poorly, he waited well. While he was waiting for God to respond, even, even his very best friends came alongside and accused him of, of wrongdoing and encouraged him to repent. And, and yet, we just see this steadfast spirit over and over and over again in his life. Even his, his own wife, you know, the, the one that should have supported him the most, comes alongside and says, you know what, just, just curse God. Give it to God. You know, tell, tell God who he is. Just curse him. And in a sense, you're saying, like, go clean yourself up. You know, just kill yourself. Curse God and go kill yourself. And through all of that, the, the, the word of God tells us that Job did not sin. He had this steadfast, enduring spirit. You know, in the deepest trials of his life, he remained steadfast. And that's what, uh, what um, James is saying, saying here. He says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And you know what? Maybe you're like, God, really? Like, compassionate and merciful? In the life of Job, you allowed Job to go through all these things? And yet at the end of Job's life, we see the compassion and the mercy of God by, by granting him all these things again and giving everything back to him. And you see the compassion and mercy of God in that. But Job waited upon the Lord patiently. In Psalm chapter 13, um, there's a few verses there I'd like to share. Psalm chapter 13, verse 1. You know, David, in the same way, waited upon God. I, I love this psalm because it, it kind of reminds us how we can do these things and how we can wait patiently with a steadfast spirit. But anyways, David comes to this point in his life too. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Maybe some of you have said some of these kinds of things to the Lord. And you're like, Lord, I've been going through these, this, this pain, this valley, 
for such a long time. When are you going to bring relief? When are you going to change the story of my life so that my testimony can go forth? And anyways, David is sitting here, and we know David experienced um, amazing things in his life. The hand of God uh, at very divine times. But we also know that the enemy often tormented his soul. And he was sometimes a lonely man. In any ways, I don't know what he was seeking from the Lord here. But he is, he's saying, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, he says, O oh Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. And then, and then he pauses. And he's like, he's, he's, like he's in, in, in the middle. He's in the middle of his struggle. In the, mil, in, you know, in the middle of this, this dark valley. And you know, some of you might be able to identify with that as well. Maybe, maybe sometimes you've been in this deep, um, these throes of depression in your life. And, and, and as he's in this spot in his life, he starts to remember the goodness of the Lord. And this is what I would encourage you to do. When you're, when you're ready to grumble and ready to complain and, and be this negative person, and, and, and you start to, to whine about all the problems that you're dealing with in your life, stop and do what David did. He has a great answer here. He says, but, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. He says, with all these, these issues, Lord, I'm waiting for you to come through for me. But he says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. And he says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. You know, when's the last time in the middle of, of your, your time of discouragement or depression You've just stopped and said, Lord, I rejoice in your salvation. I just rejoice in the fact that you have opened up my eyes to see my Savior. And that's what David does here. Then he says this, not only does, does he stop and rejoice, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So he remembers the goodness of the Lord in the midst of all his suffering. All his, his paranoia, all his, his depression, whatever he's dealing with, he, he also says, you know what, I'm going to remember that the Lord is steadfast. I'm going to rejoice in him. In fact, I'm going to sing to the Lord. And, you know, I want to encourage you with that as well. You know, nothing can be so, so dark in your life that you can't find a ray of sunshine to to separate those clouds for the, the light of Christ to shine forth and you can actually do what David did you can rejoice in fact you could even sing and most of you know what singing does singing lightens your heart singing changes your perspective so while we wait on the Lord just some practical suggestions invest in some healthy activities Get your focus off of yourself. You know, that's often the problem. We don't wait well because often the focus is on ourselves. Get the focus off of yourself and onto other people. Maybe it means that you can babysit for somebody. That's pretty simple, right? Hey, you know what? Go have a, an evening out. Bring your children over. I want to watch your children. I guess... You know, little things like that. It gets the, the focus off of yourself. Here's another one. Take an elderly couple out for lunch. Somebody who maybe doesn't get a whole lot of visit. Maybe, maybe they're older. Maybe their kids don't visit them very often anymore. Maybe they don't have any children around here. And they could just really benefit from somebody investing into their lives. That's practical. That's doing something profitable while you're waiting upon the Lord. That gets your focus off of yourself. Here's another one. Go on mission trips. Serve other people. Give of your, your talents because you have them. 
Maybe they've been buried by bitterness or negativity or grumbling. But as you repent of those things and get them out of your life, go on a mission trip. Go on some local missions. You know what? Ask um, Richard here in the church. He's, he goes to this home in Port Bruce. And you can minister to people that don't get a whole lot of ministry. He'll set you up. There's many of these opportunities. We have an opportunity coming up at the uh, nursing home in Tilsonburg. They, they've asked us if we as a church will come in and, and do Sunday services there. So we're, we're going to come with some other churches. And, uh, and, and, and we're going to give a service there at 2 o'clock for the seniors. Starting in 2020. And you know what? We could use some of your help. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's for you to just come along and after the service sit down with some of these seniors and chat with them. You know what? The, the nursing home has given us the, the opportunity and, and the liberty to share the gospel with these people. In fact, they've invited us to come in with a gospel message. That's pretty exciting to me. And you know what? We need volunteers to say, you know what? I'm tired of looking at myself and just focusing on my own problems. I want to go out and serve. I want to go do something for the, the sake of the Lord. Pray for other people while you wait. Encourage people. Send them a little text message. It can do a wonder to somebody's life when they know, hey, this person thought of me and actually cares about me and wants to be a part of my life. Little things like that. Talk the language of hope to people. Worship the Lord while you wait. Sing yourself to sleep. Whistle while you work. You know, little things, right? Hum while you pray. I like this. Somebody has said this. The song of your heart should be at its loudest when you find yourself in the waiting room of life. The song of your heart should be at its loudest when you find yourself in the waiting room of life. Then you can wait well. You know, I want to uh, um, start something. I was sharing with the elders this week. God has laid upon my heart to, 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 you know, I was inspired by what was happening with the church in Michigan last week and I was, as I was talking to a pastor and, and just really blessed by this thought of discipleship. And, and God has laid on my heart to take about six or seven men and go through an in-depth discipleship where, 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 where we can study God's word together, where we can challenge each other, where, where I can encourage you uh, to not only be a disciple, but to be a disciple maker. And so I'm looking for, for a number of men that want to say, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of living this mediocre life and being self-focused. I want to live for Jesus. And, and so I'm, I'm interested in taking a number of men, maybe every, every other week, and, and studying the word of God, and not only being a disciple of Christ, but but, but getting towards being a disciple maker. Where, where you take a group of men yourself after this. And, and you make disciples. And so that as a church we become a disciple making church. Taking the, 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 the command of Jesus personally. Where he says go into all the world and make disciples. Taking the word of God literally. And so if you're interested in this come talk to me takes courage I know say you know what I'd like to go deeper I'd like to be a part of something like this come and talk to me about it let's just finish up here yet in verse 12 he says above all my brothers do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation you know how many of us know that as we relate to this verse, I was looking at this verse and I was thinking, you're just talking about patience and now you're talking about, about swearing. And, you know, the Lord was just, was just reminding me how often, as we're impatient before the Lord, do we 
start to use our mouth in the wrong way. You know, when somebody cuts you off down the road, you're pretty quick maybe sometimes to, to yell at them. Maybe you do something you have no business doing because you let anger get a hold of you. And so often we, we, we um, lose our temper and we say things that we shouldn't be saying. And, and, and James is just putting this out there as a reminder. You know, as you wait upon the Lord, remember that the judge is standing at the door. Don't be this grumbling person, but you know what? Go even further. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't need to, to add all, this, all these other unnecessary words to emphasize what you mean. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And he says there, that, so that you may not fall under condemnation. That you may not fall under condemnation. So we need to, to be careful with the way we communicate. You know, we, we already studied in James chapter 3, verse 5, how, how James says that a great forest is set ablaze by our tongue. He says, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. He says, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, he says, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So as you wait on the Lord, you have an opportunity to wait well or wait poorly. And remember that other people are judging you. Other people are going to come to a conclusion about how you handle situations in life. So may your testimony, may my testimony be more like Job's where we have this steadfast spirit about us that comes out even, even as we're squeezed. And somebody has said this, as you're squeezed, you know, just like a lemon is squeezed, um, you know, sweetness comes out of it. I mean, as, as we're squeezed by the trials that come across our life, let, let's hope that sweetness comes out of it so that other people can observe these things about us we don't need to swear. We don't need to, to curse and get all mad when things don't go our way. No, there ought to be this sweet spirit about us in our life, even, even when somebody cuts you off, even when somebody has just really, really got you fired up and has done something maybe that was not even fair and just towards you. You know what? Don't get all heated up about it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know, Job practiced this so well. Even, even when his wife came to him and said, curse God, just curse God and die. You know what? Really, she was encouraging him to, to use all manner of speech, of swearing, or whatever it might be, to God, to, to really just blaspheme God. She was encouraging him to do this and then, and then to give up on his life. And, and Job says this, he says, hey, Listen, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not also receive evil? We can receive both, he says. We recognize that God is still sovereign. God is still in control. It says in all these things, Job did not sin with his lips. He did not sin with his lips. And, and, and you know, that's why he's this supreme example, or this great example that, that, that James is bringing forth here. He's saying, hey, look at Job. Look at everything he went through. And you know, this ought to be a reminder for us. Uh, I, would, I would pretty much guarantee to say that none of us have experienced the, the, the suffering to the degree that Job experienced it. And so if we can look at him as an example and say, hey, if Job could remain steadfast and focused on the fact that God was still compassionate and merciful with everything that he went through and, and have this thought, you know, shall we not also be willing to receive bad things as well? Understand that negative things will come our way, that life won't always be as ideal as we wish it would be. You know, as we, as we close there, I'd like you just to look at Isaiah chapter 40. 
verse 28, Isaiah 40, 28, says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth, even young people, he says, shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Is there any creature more majestic in some ways than an eagle? I, I love these, these just observing. You know, and, and unfortunately, I don't always see them um, around here, but I know they're making an increase around here. But if you ever watch a video, and I've done this many times where I've watched an eagle soar through the heavens, in the freedom, in the liberty that it soars through the heavens with, you know, it, it recognizes, it's confident in who it is. And we ought to understand the principle in that. We ought to understand this thought that if we wait upon the Lord, God says that we will be able to soar like the wings of an eagle. Mount up, he says, with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall be able to walk and not faint. So wait upon the Lord. Trust in him. Be patient. As you're patiently waiting for the Lord, don't be negative. Maybe some of us need to repent today from that. Maybe we need to say, you know, as other people have observed me go through these situations in life, I haven't demonstrated the spirit of Christ very well. Remember the steadfastness of Job in the midst of your waiting. And remember that as you, you wait upon the Lord, he will give you strength. Even so that you can soar like an eagle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you care about us. We thank you that you're committed to us even in the midst of our failures. And Father, I pray for each person here today. Lord, I pray that you would remind them of who they are in you. That you would remind them what you have done for them. That you are a compassionate and merciful God. Lord, that you would remind them that in the midst of their difficulties, they can trust you. But even, even beyond that, Lord, they can even rejoice like David did. They can even sing as unto you, Lord. Father, would you, would you give each one that reminder and that, that word, that thought, when they're going through difficult times. Lord, while we're here this morning, it may not seem like it, Lord, but as we get into the week, as we get into the week, sometimes we're faced with a valley or a, a trial that seems insurmountable, Lord. And sometimes we've allowed it to, to get to us. And Lord, we've become negative, complaining people as a result. Lord, I pray this morning that you would just reveal yourself to each one. Lord, that you would cause each one, Lord, to, to know what you are trying to do through their lives, what you're trying to reveal to them, that they would trust in you, Lord, that they would, they would just be able to give themselves over completely to you. And Lord, I, I pray for those here this morning who may not know you personally. Father, life is already challenging enough as a believer. I can't imagine what it must be like to live without you. And Lord, I pray for each one here, if there's those listening, and those here this morning that don't know you personally, Lord, would you reveal to them that if they would turn their lives over to you, they too could wait upon you. They too could experience Isaiah 40 in their lives. They too could experience the energy, the strength that comes from you in living a life plugged into you. Lord, I, I pray that you would convict and that you would um, bring about an awareness of who you are so that uh, each one here 
each one listening, Lord, could hear, be changed, could be saved, could be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray that as a church, that all of us, Lord, would be able to be a sweet-smelling Savior to those around us, Lord. That the aroma that comes out of our lives would um, be sweet, refreshing, encouraging to those around us. Lord, we, 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 we just trust that, that uh, Christ would be exalted in our testimony. So Lord, we just commit these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen.